so this talk really is about embracing vulnerabilities. And when I'm done, we're going to kind of open it up again for, for sharing questions, reflections. And also, I'm, I'm going to share, you know, a few personal experiences, which you know, I think are relevant, and maybe some of you will be able to relate to that. And you know, I, I, it, vulnerability is, it has been a theme that I've been exploring for 50 plus years since I was quite young, quite a long time ago. And then after I share some about my own journey and my own narratives, I'm going to kind of connect it to some larger themes and the relevance to our lives in both personal and professional relationships. So it all began for me uh, back in Highland Park, New Jersey, a long time ago. And you know, we all, again, we all have our experience and our stories about our families and how you know, in some ways we were seen, in some ways we were maybe not loved and maybe not respected and perhaps not. Uh, that was certainly the case for me. Now, in my family, uh, I, I characterize it as a kind of an emotional war zone. My father was quite uh, emotionally abusive. He really had a, he was, he was really a sweet person underneath, but he never learned to deal with his vulnerabilities. You know, and so he got super defensive and he, he had a preferred fight part of the fight, flight, freeze, appease, defensive reactions. And he used to scream at my mother, you know, all the time, like many times every day. And I felt like I was kind of like, oh my God, how do I get out of here? I can't take it. But of course, as a little kid, I couldn't get out. And that's the case with all of us as little kids. We're in these, we refined ourselves in these contexts, we go, what on earth happened here? The, the um, existential philosopher, Martin Heidegger, he said that, that we are all thrown into the world. You know, and you're kind of like, wait, kind of go, why did, how did I get here? What, what's, what's going on? Why am I here? Who, who am I with? And so questions can abound. And, and in my family, I couldn't really ask anyone about those. I had a lot of considerations, questions, doubts, fears, but I couldn't talk about them. It wasn't safe. My father, in his um, kind of abusiveness, he would call my brother Mark. He called him Marcy. You know, he. I remember he, uh, he would say that if I was uh, you know, near him, he'd say like, "My breath could be used as a secret weapon that could be used against Russia." You know, which he, he was being sarcastic, of course. But as a little kid, you know, I took that like, "What's wrong with me? Is there something like?" You know, on the inside, that's uh, poisoned. You know, and so this was an ongoing fight all the time, every day, you know, with my brother and sister and my mother. And it just felt super unsafe to me. And I was the youngest by quite a long shot in there. Now, flash forward a few years, my father, who was really a poster child for, you know, a heart attack, he had one and he was in a coma for six weeks or so. And they somehow miraculously came out of it and lived, you know, several months longer. And then he wound, I wound up being in the basement of our house and he was walking to the bathroom. I happened to be there and I saw him whoosh, fall over like a bowling pin and slam his head on the linoleum floor. And, you know, the 911 was called and you know, he, he died that day. And, you know, it was... You know, tragic for a young kid to lose lose a parent, uh, and you know there was a part of me that was kind of relieved in a certain way, and a part of me that was aggrieved. You know, and and despite how difficult it was in my family, I really went downhill after that, and I was kind of a kind of cute, smart little kid, but my I took a real nosedive and. I kept going down, 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 even though I may not have looked like it from the outside. And by the time I was a freshman in college, you know, I was really depressed. I mean, like every day, like super, super depressed. And by the time I, I became a, a sophomore, I was, I felt like my life was crumbling. I literally, I couldn't look another human being in the eyes. I was, so, I lived in such an intense state of anxiety and then depression. I could go back and forth between anxiety and depression. And I wound up with a much, again, longer story, wound up seeing my first therapist, not my last. And I remember uh, sitting with him in 
Boston and kind of telling him that like I I don't know where where I end and other people begin, and which is a, I think a question that a lot of us have on some level. And so I I went through the process of therapy for two and a half years before I left Boston, half the time twice a week, and my, my therapist told me that at the end of my time working with him, that the type of kind of panic he saw in me was similar to people who he, who he saw hospitalized. You know, and so I, thought, and I was glad he didn't tell me that two and a half years earlier. I was in much better shape. And part of what my journey was about, and I'd say a significant part of it, was about you know, expressing my secrets, my shame, my jealousies, my doubts, essentially my vulnerabilities that I just didn't want people to know. And I tried so hard on grip on them to, to not show them. But, you know, the more you tighten around something, on some level, the more evident it becomes and the less you can actually deal with it. So in this process, I found that my expressing my vulnerabilities, really telling him about like the jealousies of my, my handsome, uh, you know, uh, friend, you know, who uh, the girls swooning all over him. And I was like jealous about that. And I was, or I'd be competitive in, in a certain way, or I'd be shamed or feeling shame about just about everything. Just by, by speaking about those out loud, it began, something started to change in my brain. And I started to really get the, hey, you know what? If I really want, and if I'm really gonna create what I really want, which are connections with people, I have to show up in a different way. And so I made a decision pretty early in life, 2021, that I was gonna just you know, tell my truth, you know, beauty warts and all. And I've continued that practice for you know, many, many, many decades since then. And so much so, and it's been such a powerful practice for me that I've, you know, I've led workshops on, on vulnerability and I've been leading particularly you know, weekly men's groups for my 38th year of that, we're really focused on being real with each other and not letting go you know, of the pretenses and the guards and the having to be perfect and having to be strong and having to be all these things and finding that the, the true beauty, you know, the true beauty emerges when people are real. And I, I've witnessed so much of that over thousands and thousands and thousands of hours. It's just, it never, it never ceases to touch me. A.H. Almas, who was the main person behind the Diamond Heart approach, he said, vulnerability becomes the door to intimacy, to being ourselves, to being real, to being where we are. But for that to happen, we have to be willing to be vulnerable to what is. Being vulnerable means that our soul is open for things to arise in it. It's not defended. I, I think that vulnerability is often really misunderstood. You know, when you think about the Eightfold Path, the Eightfold Path begins with right understanding. And the thing is, if you have wrong understanding, if you have misunderstandings from the outset, everything after that takes you in a different direction. Now you can come back and course correct, but to misunderstand that and think that somehow in this case, you know, vulnerability is bad and should hide it, you know, you know, you shouldn't let anyone see it and you shouldn't even know about it yourself, that is not a great thing for creating connected relationships. I oftentimes think about the, the, the word intimacy. I know a lot of times people think of the word intimacy as, as synonymous with sexuality. I don't, you know, I think that you can have intimacy with sexuality as the best if you're gonna be sexual, but you can have intimacy without sexuality and you can have sexuality without intimacy. And think of the word intimacy as the phonetic, intimacy, allowing others to see into you. But in our, in our culture, you know, we have these ideals of like having no vulnerabilities, you know, and to hide, to hide them, don't let people see. And the shame, 
you know, of feeling vulnerable. When you think about the word shame, the etymology of the word shame is to cover, like hiding, lowering your head in shame, hiding yourself, shame, like there's something horrible about who I am on the inside. You think about it in 12 step programs, I have a saying that you're, you're only as sick as your secrets. And the word secret, you know, it means is, is comes from the Latin secrets, which means to tear from the flesh. And so our secrets really can separate us. And when you think about Sangha, which I know that this, you know, that this is part of Sangha, is about the, the willingness to share vulnerabilities and recognizing the courage it takes to do so. Now, vulnerability is, you know, in one, in one domain isn't great. And that has to do with competitive domains. You know, if you're playing a sport, what, you, what do you do with your competitor? You know, in your team, you look to see what are the vulnerabilities of the other and then you exploit them. But when we have the same paradigm, when we look at our relationships that way, things don't tend to go that well. Now, I'm sure most or all of you know about Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs in psychology. And I think maybe even in the cultural zeitgeist, it's, it's like a sacred cow. You don't really challenge that. You know, that, you know, self-actualization at the top, you know, but, at, but when we look at, at the bottom of it, there's physiological at the bottom and then safety. And then the next rung he has is belonging and relationships. There is a UCLA neuropsychologist named Matthew Lieberman who challenged that. And when he challenged it, I went, wow, <laughs> I, never, I hadn't thought about this totally right. And what he said was that actually belonging and relationships is at the very bottom of it. You don't belong, you're not a part of, you're born into this planet as a totally dependent being. You know, if, you, if, if you're not in relation, you don't have caretakers who are taking care of you, you're dead. That's just the way it is. And so we have a certain inherent vulnerability in being alive and to each other. And I think a lot of times, People shame themselves because they have anxiety about relating, you know, being in personal relationships. You know, what does this person think about me? How do they feel about me? You think about even going to a party when people were having parties or going into various situations where people are. And most people, if they're being honest with themselves, feel some levels of anxiety in having those experiences. And when you think about it, and it really have understanding, right? Understanding and compassion it totally makes sense because you think about the territory of if you were you know, reaching out, you're trying to get involved in a group and you get rejected by the group where you experience yourself being rejected or excluded in some way. When you think about it, the worst thing that happens is you get excluded and you think about the tribe because we have tribal brains. We grew up in tribes you know, historically. To be excluded in the tribe is a death sentence. And so when we are wired to want to be included and feel the need to be included because your survival is actually dependent on that, it makes it a whole lot more sense that when you feel anxiety socially, you can kind of tune into like, wow, well, there is a part of me, a part of me that feels threatened in relationship and I naturally want to be accepted. Some years ago, <clears throat> I uh, received an email from a couple who would have a, uh, a picnic. You know, I live in Marin County, not too far from Rick, actually. And they would have a picnic every year. And they would, I, would, I would get invited, and I would never go. I said, oh, maybe I'll go. And, and so one year, my wife was gone. And I just thought, oh, yeah, I'm going to go. And so I drove there. It was a beautiful summer day. And I felt perfectly fine. And I pulled up to this parking lot and I looked out, saw people at the picnic and suddenly, I really at the clear blue sky, I just felt totally anxious. I was like, like my heart was kind of like racing suddenly. Um, and it, it was really at that moment that I, I realized how much I had changed over the years, because instead of having my old, the old voice in me that become like, 
Give me a break, Daniel. What is wrong with you? How many years of therapy have you had? You're a psychologist. Give me a break. You're scared of going to a picnic? Seriously? But that's not the voice I heard. <sighs> the voice I heard was, hey, Daniel, that makes perfect sense. You know, you don't know who's going to be at this picnic. There's stranger danger. There feel that you're wired to have some level of threat to go into unfamiliar social situations. And when I did that, remarkably, not remarkably to me now, but remarkably, suddenly my anxiety just, just dropped. And I think there's a basic principle, you know, in this. I mean, you think about, for those of us who are old enough to remember the saying, that which we resist persists, uh, that to simply be with, you know, the experience as it is and to have right understanding and compassion, really, you know, about that is something that, if you look at that vulnerable part, it needs. You think about, like, the little kid, and we all have a little kid inside of us, and you think about the little kid is paradoxically the oldest part of us, that that little kid, if it's going like, I'm scared in some way, or I need some help, and you'll get over yourself. And hear these things, he's like, man up, get over it, come on, be tough. What happens with that part? It goes underground. You know, it gets hidden, shamed. Don't look at me. And that's not what we need. You know, the, the reality is that we are vulnerable and, there, and there, are, there are facts of vulnerability. Vulnerability is a fact. You know, think about the heavenly messengers, old age, disease, and death. You know, in the best of all possible worlds, we're gonna have at least two of those, old age and death. That's talk about vulnerability. Try to keep yourself alive. You know, think about in Buddhism, it's been said that Buddhism is built around two primary concepts, both involving death. One is that we're all going to die. And the second is we don't know when that's going to happen. Does anyone here know when you're going to die? Or how are you going to die exactly? You know, it's, it's a great unknown. And it's just sitting out there as an, as an informant in some way. You know, and so vulnerability and being human are inextricably connected. This is just a fact. And connection and what we need is also vulnerable. I mean, many people get getting marriage and get divorced. You know, and you think about marriage, and I've done a lot of marriage counseling. And I've said to couples, you know, married couples at times, and, you know, to be married to be in a relationship, but I've said to married couples at times, I said, you know, your relationship is going to end in one of the two Ds. In case that's not clear, the death or divorce. And that's just the way it ends, right? And so we get to, you know, experience as much joy and pleasure and connection, and love and the good stuff in life while we're on this planet. And at the same time, to recognize that our relationships can feel fragile. You know, I think about, you know, not only just saying the, the things that you you know, kind of wish we're different in a relationship. Like I wish, like uh, uh, a woman, I'm forgetting your name, was saying about what do I do with this guy who won't, you know, kind of practice vulnerability. I think it's important, you know, you don't necessarily like, charge over that, but to to really be, you know, willing to speak about those things is a cell phone because you don't know what you're going to get back, you know, and that's what really makes it courageous to be willing to do so. I think a lot of the times people actually really appreciate other people. You know, we oftentimes think about the difficult things you have to say, you know, that somehow they're like critiques or criticisms, you know, of the other person. I think a lot of times, you know, people, you know, they care, you know, and they they don't know how to even say that. You know, I know that as a as a longtime friend of Rick, and he's my, you know, he's my top two friends on this planet, you know, and you know, there are times I've I've you know, I felt vulnerable with him. Like, I, I don't want to lose Rick's love. 
I, I, I'm not in danger of it, you know, but I just can be aware of the inklings of that. And I think that if you really tune into yourself, that there are people in your life that you're like, I really care about this person. And it would feel maybe even devastating, you know, to not have them in my life. You know, and how do I kind of breathe into the vulnerability of that and not shame yourself about it? These, these feelings are natural and we need to embrace those. I was, I was on a, a call with these two guys from, who have a, a part of an organization in Chicago a couple of months ago, and I was going to do some presentation for them. And at, at one point uh, in the conversation, I, I leaned forward and I was kind of pretending to be this little kid and kind of like saying to like, I, I like you. Do, do you like me? You know, the, the innocence of the child. And one of them, he wrote a blog about it. And, he, and I want to share this with you. I, mean, I had no idea what was going to come of this. But he, he said, at one point, as we discuss fear to connect, Daniel explained that we lose or is it sucked out of us, the wonder, the courage of our childhood. He shared that we didn't have a problem asking for friendship as children. I, I wouldn't quite say it like that, that earlier, earlier in life, but you start learning, don't, you know, start protecting yourself as children also. Moving closer to the camera in an innocent boy's voice, he said, I like you, do you like me? Unquote. And he said, got to say, I got a little verklempt. As a man, do I fear putting myself out there, being authentic, asking for what I truly want and need? Do I lack the courage to connect? When I lack the courage to connect, here's what I do. I don't say. I don't do. I'm too concerned with what others might think. Uh, this stuff is so near and dear to my heart. I just so much want to, I want to live in a world where people will be willing to, to, to really say these things. And in order to do that, we need to really be encouraging people's vulnerability. There is a, a movie called uh, The Mask You Live In, which is about how boys are raised. I mean, that's been part of my own you know, personal and professional journeys, like kind of male evolution and how, how guys become, you know, strong and heartful, not just tough guys. And there's a, there's a scene in this movie where there's an African-American man who's got a little kid whose name is Jackson. And what happened was that he got a woman pregnant when he was in college and she was going to have an abortion. And he begged her, don't have the abortion, I'll take the child. And she agreed. Now, flash forward nine years later, Jackson's nine years old. You see Jackson in the movie. And the, the man, who's this beautiful, beautiful African American, so sweet. And he said, one, he said, one day, Jackson said to me, he said, Daddy, I'm sensitive. And the guy who's talking about this, and he did something which a lot of guys have would not do he, he went like okay <laughs> what is that you know so he started googling sensitivity and sort of learning about that and really what this kid was saying was daddy i'm i'm vulnerable i'm a vulnerable being he knew that about himself and his father hadn't squashed it out of him and so he could just be open about the reality of his vulnerability Now, I'm, I don't mean in any way to suggest that it's, it's awesome to walk around feeling vulnerable all the time. It's, it's not my point. The, the, my point is really where there's vulnerability, there needs to be love. There needs to be openness. There needs to be compassion. There needs to be understanding. To really embrace that and to work with oneself to like, you know, okay, you know, that's, that's vulnerable. And as someone said, bring resources to that. It's not like all of you is vulnerable. Because when you really think about human beings, I, I mean, I know I do. I think through the lens of complexity. I can say, 
you know, that there are parts of me that feel quite vulnerable. Like even doing this, this with you tonight, it's not my comfort zone, you know, so to speak, doing this, you know, so it's kind of like, okay, I felt more anxiety, you know, in this. But then I would just kind of keep coming back and breathing and recognizing it's a part of me that feels vulnerable, but other parts of me actually don't feel vulnerable. So it's not a like I'm totally vulnerable and everything to everyone at every moment. There are parts of us that are going to feel more vulnerable than other parts of us at different times in different contexts, you know, and to be open to those. Now, I think that you know, to really, you know, appreciate, you know, and understand this is to really kind of start where you are and to breathe into that vulnerability, not deny it, you know, but also at the same time, begin to question, is there really a threat here? Because vulnerability is, is, is also related to threat. Is there really a threat? Because, you know, at the same time that vulnerability is a fact, it's also a feeling. And sometimes, the vulnerable feelings, they don't need to be quite like that. And so when we bring awareness, okay, there's vulnerability. And then we can start going like, like really doing a little bit of emotional archeology span in a sense of going like, is there really a threat here? Like what's the worst that can happen? I mean, is my survival really on the line here? And so we have to you know, recognize that part of the either design flaw, you know, or feature in the human brain is that we imagine things that don't exist. We imagine threats that don't exist. I'm sure Rick has spoken, I'm sure on many occasions about um, the negativity bias, you know, how the brain is organized around negativity, why we're most likely to, more, more likely to, or to see a snake as a stick or a stick as a snake than a snake as a stick because we're, we're primed you know, for threats, you know, and so really part of the vulnerability is to say, is it, is it really, you know, some type of risk here? Ah, so let's see. So I'm going to, I'm going to pause here uh, now, and I want to, I want to open it up. I think I've shared a bunch of things. I could say a whole bunch more, but I want this to be more interactive, you know, at this point. So I want to open it up to questions, reflections you have about the territory that we've been exploring tonight. Erin. Hi, Daniel. Hi. Thank you so much for, um, oh, I can hear myself. Um, great, thank you so much for your, um, your vulnerability. It was wonderful. Um, when you said that you were sitting at the at the in the parking lot, um, and um, what you didn't hear at the picnic was the voice that said, "Come on, get it together." You know, um, that's the voice that I've been saying to myself for decades. And now, when I try now for the past several years, when I try to cultivate a softer, kinder approach, that little girl in me, forgive my French, is saying, "Fuck off." Like, I'm, I'm not going to be vulnerable with you. I'm not going to, uh, I don't trust you. You've been mean to me for too long. And so I'm in this constant anxiety because I can't soothe myself hmm. because I don't trust myself, if that makes any sense. I'm not sure of mine. Well, first of all, let's take a breath. You know, and just appreciate your vulnerability. You know, for sharing that, that's got to be you know, painful and scary. Yeah. And and I have a question for you: Is this related to one particular person, or is this in general? They say, "Fuck, you know, f that," and you know, et cetera. It, it's my relationship with myself. So when I try to soothe myself, when I try to be kind, the way that you, that voice you know, that the kindness, how you spoke to yourself. When I try to do that now, the little one in me is saying, too late, you've hurt me too much. I'm not going to allow you to soothe me. I'm not gonna, I'm, you know, go, go away. It's between me and me. No, I, I, I'm feeling into it. I'm sure I'm not the only one. You know, this might be an opportunity to do some inner dialoguing. You know, and so you think about that little person inside who's been hurt, wounded, and you know, essentially is distrusting 
uh, you, whoever that you is, capacity to take care of her, you know, and to honor her and to protect her, essentially. She has not felt protected. And so I would want to, like, dialogue and say, look, oh, God, that sounds horrible. You know, I get it. And, And I can understand why you wouldn't want to trust me. You know, because there certainly have been times when I haven't protected you. And I'm really sorry about that. And I want to hear more about your your pain and what, where you're sitting. And so you can literally kind of go back and forth, you know, between these two, these two different characters inside of you. And there are certainly ways of even like drawing that. Like sometimes the creative arts are fantastic. At, Kind of bringing out this this voice. Now, a, a question, Aaron: <clears throat> Is this a is this a newer voice in the last few years, or is that something that you know? No, I I had a um, a contemplative practice for a number of years, and then I had a somebody that I love very much died um, a, a couple of decades ago, and something inside of me broke, and I sort of said to the world um, and to anything that wanted to soothe or comfort me, including myself, um, I won't be baited. You know, I, I thought you, I was vulnerable. I was, I trusted the world. I, I put myself out there and you broke my heart. So anything now, any sort of attempt to soothe or comfort me, I take as a threat because I think you're just going to pull the rug out from under me again. You're going to wait until I'm trusting you, and then you're going to hurt me again. Mm. I mean, there's no easy answer to this. Thank you, because I thought I was nuts. (laughs) Well, we're probably all nuts, as it turns out, as human beings, but no, you're not. I mean, it makes it makes a lot of sense. And, you know, to some degree, it really takes courage to love when you've been hurt. You know, and, and, you know, to me, you know, I've been hurt a lot, you know, in love. And to some degree, it's still the only show in town. You know, so it's like there's inherent risk. I mean, vulnerability involves risk. But I would really want to focus on what, you know, why. You know, the power of why. What's the purpose in revealing vulnerability? Because, you know, it. it It can feel lousy, you know, in a certain way, but you're doing it for a particular outcome, just like an exercise, which I've I've done a lot of in my life. I I don't really enjoy it, but I'm doing it, you know, for a particular outcome, the willingness to do that. All right, so Erin, I'm going to thank you very much. I really appreciate your vulnerability. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Judith. Um, Hello, thank you so much. for your. your your talk, I I guess I'm I'm trying I've been struggling with how to how to frame this, um, but um, I guess part of my question has to do with is, is sort of like how to deal with a situation where by opening up with one's own vulnerability it actually makes other people vulnerable, I guess um, I guess my situation is I'm a survivor of clergy sexual misconduct and um so you know when i i've found that when i tend to be vulnerable about that sort of thing that it really triggers a lot of people um and in particular the people that that um exploited me um and their superiors and you know it's like anyway yeah I, it, uh, I I don't know. It's it's I, I you know it's it's like and in, in sort of like part of the be vulnerable so people can say oh quit playing the victim. You um, know, it's like, <laughs> I mean, but I I guess but well, part of my I guess let me let me just talk say a little bit more about this is like I I'm convinced that 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 in order to deal with these kinds of problems there needs to be more. Um, openness and acknowledgement it it needs to stop being secret and um and um and it's like i you know it's like it's like 
the church just likes to sweep it under the rug still. I mean, it's like even after everything. And, and, and it's like, I, I tried, I, I had three different cases and three different denominations and yeah, that's a whole, you know, that, that's a very complex situation we're dealing with. I mean, uh, one of the most important <laughs> things, that, if I may oh, just, if I may yeah. just say this, one of the most important parts of uh, being vulnerable is choosing wisely about who you're going to be vulnerable with. I don't think yeah. everyone, you know, is is meriting and deserving of yours or anyone else's vulnerability, and certainly in a situation like that, where there's risk for them, you know, to acknowledge that you know they screwed up and were horrible and et cetera like that. That's a, that that's comes in the territory of restorative justice. And that is not a simple area. And so it, it's yours is a particularly unusual area. And I would make sure I had people who I really could be vulnerable with because that's kind of like more lawsuit. You know, well, yeah, I mean, it's like in some ways, this is old news. I mean, it's like, I guess one of the things that I. I, I feel real frustrated about is that I tried to um, force um, the church to I encourage the church to uh, make public what happened. I mean, not not details but just to uh, some kind of public acknowledgement that something happened well i um, i wish i wish you the very best with that that is and 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 i guess with the sadness for me is i like i know this the particular priest that was involved in this sort of like knew that that would was what was needed but but um right. that never happened he's dead and and it's like i just feel this 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 real grief that you know that there it could have been different it could have been healing for all of us yeah. Yeah. and it, and it wasn't and it's i guess that's anyway yeah i hear you feel you so i wish you the best that's that's a tough situation all right thank you all right davida can you hear me i and i read you can you hear me Yes. I'd like to know how you meet these people that will not smile to your face and bad mouth you behind your back for any little anything when you are vulnerable. I'll bet you there are a bunch of people in the Sangha who would who would fit that bill. You know, I mean, one of the part of the beauty of Sangha is you, you know, the potential to meet like minded, like hearted people, you know, and. You know, you, there's there's a lot of positive energy in your sangha, and I don't know to what degree you organize groups, you know, around it within your sangha. But I I'm I'm a believer in groups, you know, and I've I've been in a lot and I've led a lot, and I I think that you know when you have the, a similar understanding about why you're there, you know, that you really want love, you really want connection. That's what people are there about. And they want to deal with the stuff that gets in the way of it. Then you have people who are going to be, you know, the kind of the kinds of people that you want to uh, be vulnerable with. But, you know, there's no uh, way to kind of over, kind of go through the, you know, the, the issues around vulnerability, meaning that, you can't just wait till you totally trust in order to be vulnerable because by the very nature of vulnerability, you develop trust through that and how people respond to you. So, you know, sometimes it's looking for groups. You know, there are wonderful groups out there and, and where you get to practice vulnerability. Okay, so thank you. All right, so let's see, Lynn, Lynn is it? Yes, it is, Lynn. Hi, Lynn. Hi. So um, it's just very synchronistic. I feel that I tuned in tonight because I'm not always able to. Um, I've just myself been through something where I really accessed um, a really deep vulnerability in that it had to do with family um, of a long time ago. I was adopted. And I was the eldest and I have a brother and a sister who were the natural born children. And our, in our family, it was never spoken of. So it was like a secret. And um, 
It took, I, I took a class a few, couple of months ago, I guess it's been called Finding Yourself in Transition. And of course, synchronistically, what came along was a suggestion to that I read about a book that I thought might be helpful, which is called The Body Keeps the Score. Sure. Uh, are you familiar with that? Um, I have seen Bessel van der Kolk speak one time. And so I was really impressed with him because, of course, his whole psychiatric career is around mental illness and PTSD and working with veterans, but also other people experiencing trauma. And uh, so I've, I've been reading that book. And it just then, of course, what happened was my brother, and my sister happened to come to San Francisco. They live out of state. And I decided this is the time. This is the time. I don't care. Well, the first few weeks, once I knew they were coming, I couldn't sleep. I'd wake up in the middle of the night. I was I was filled with terror. And I thought how silly this is that I should be afraid of this. But I think it was the whole idea that they would abandon me um, because I wasn't really part of them. Sure. So um, I made a point when we got together one evening of talking about it. I didn't really get much of a reaction or a response or a dialogue, but at least I did it. And I'm sleeping better every night now. <laughs> That's been... So it paid off. That's so what, really what you're saying is this is an issue for each of us and what we get out of it, not to really benefit from what other people reactions or responses are and i um i really appreciate your speaking to that thank you well thank you and thank you for your courage that's awesome mm, thank you yeah. all right rachel rachel you okay oh yeah it wouldn't let me unmute but now i am yeah thank you i, right. I appreciate this topic and i appreciate the words that you've given us so far um, I was wondering if you had any general comments in regards to PTSD and vulnerability and um, what's your experience with that? Thank you. I was that for a small question? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, when you, if you have, really have PTSD, I think it's probably best to work with a professional, you know, because you don't want to just expose everything at once. <clears throat> there's like the whole theme of titrating, you know, a, a little bit. Can, how, can I do a little bit? And can I show a little bit? And even like when I, in the meditation, when I said, think about <clears throat> someone who you feel some kind of vulnerability with, but like on a scale of five, not 10, you know, and it may be on a scale of one, you know, or two, but I would really recommend working with a professional you know, who really is a, a specializes in PTSD. Thank you. But, but, but also, you know, if you have trusted people in your life, you know, to, to be willing to share with them, you know, and, and I think it's important how you introduce vulnerability as well. It's not like just jumping into it. You know, it's much more about creating a context for this, you know, in the power in the vulnerability workshop that Rick and I are going to be co-leading at the end of March, we're going to be walking you through kind of step-by-step -step processes in terms of even, you know, creating context, you know, for the communication. But I would highly recommend just saying like, hey, there's something I want to talk with you about, and it feels vulnerable for me to share this with you. You know, are you open to hearing it? Or is this a good time for that? You know, to like let the person know rather than be a, a blurter. I, I'm a recovering blurter myself, so I know a little something about this. All right, thank you. For those of you who are on earlier, before we start, I said something about Rick. For, for to me, you know, to be in Rick Sangha with you all is really it's a blessing. You know, for me, so I, I thank you for really from the bottom of my heart to you know, to be here with you tonight. Thank you very much.